a book or gospel and really um, plowing in and digging in. Um, have you guys ever seen like a crime show or a detective show? Raise your hand if you've ever seen one. Uh, raise your hand if you actually like them. Does anyone actually like them? Okay, we got a few people like them. My wife likes them. No, it's interesting. When you're watching what? When you're watching these shows, it's interesting because there's a few themes, right? It makes a really good detective show. Um, they're always looking for more evidence or they're looking for more witnesses. And one of the things that happens is they get more evidence or more witnesses and they're looking for the culprit or the perpetrator, right? It starts to build a picture of the person they're looking for. Um, it starts to give them a like an image, or it starts to help them, uh, the detective, know where they need to look. And I hope that as we're going through Luke, as Kaylee is preaching and as I am preaching, hopefully you're getting two different perspectives, and hopefully it's a helpful, um, helpful addition to have both of us. So we're getting a picture painted of Luke from a couple different perspectives. Um, so that. As we read through Luke, hopefully Luke's perspective on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is helping to inform us, because there's four Gospels, and they each kind of have a different perspective. So hopefully um, Luke will help inform us well. Um, so today we're going to be in Luke um, chapter 1. If you want to turn with me, and I'm going to be uh, reading 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, Jacob forever, his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be bo So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So while Elizabeth was pregnant and all the events of that last section that Keely was um, preaching on last week have unfolded, um, Mary here is approached by an angel who explains what is going to happen to her. Mary is startled at the presence of the angel and inquires how this is all going to happen. And after the angel explains, Mary willingly and obediently submits. Um, when you're reading through Luke, and especially reading through last week and this week's section, we start to see a lot of similarities between the different sections. Luke carefully lays out parallels between Mark and uh, Mary, sorry, and Zechariah. We need to pay close attention. In particular, we see this parallel format um, in a lot of really similar ways um, in their characteristics. The first thing is that we see is that Zechariah and Elizabeth, and currently Mary, are both not able to have a child. It helps. It helps if you're going the, holding it the right way. What did you do? 
Put this back on. You're going backwards. <laughs> watch that again. It doesn't really fit the sermon. So the first thing that we see is that they're both unable to have kids. On Elizabeth was unable to have kids and was advanced in age, while Mary was a virgin. Secondly, they both, I think it worked, um, they both have the same messenger and a similar message, the angel Gabriel. The third similarity is that they are both told they will have children, and these children will both be important. And finally, both Mary and Zechariah have songs that testify to what God was doing. This parallel between the passages is unmistakable. As we start to look at all the ways that Zechariah and Mary are being paralleled, it is also um, important to look at some of the differences. And there are a few glaring differences. No doubt a big difference is that one of the promised children is to be John the Baptist, and the other is to be the long-awaited and expected Messiah, the Savior of the world. The children are very different. Yet there are other significant differences beyond this. When we look at both Zechariah and Mary, more specifically, we see differences in what makes them them. Zechariah is old, while Mary is very young. He is mature, and I think it's very reasonable to expect that he had, with his maturity, attained a significant amount of spiritual maturity as well. Verse 6 makes it clear that Zechariah was righteous before God. And beyond just maturity, he also had a high religious and cultural position. He had an amount of authority and respect. Mary, on the other hand, had no position, no social standing, no authority, and no respect. Remember, too, that Zechariah's position wouldn't have been easy to attain either. Priests spent their entire lives learning and memorizing the Torah. Their education was rigorous. Before they could even study under another priest, they had to memorize the Pentateuch, which for us is the first five books of the New Old Testament. Look at the first five books and imagine trying to memorize the whole thing as a child. Mary had no such training and no such education. At the time, this education was only for promising and successful boys. While Luke's Gospel has been careful and deliberate in using a lot of interesting ways to parallel these two characters, he's very careful to also look at their differences. But I haven't even gotten to the most significant difference, and the one that I want to talk most about this morning, their response to the angel. Zechariah's response comes in verse 18. He says, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Zechariah responds with a peculiar amount of skepticism. And doubt when informed by an angel. Zechariah responds with a need for more information and proof. His response is the great upset of the whole chapter. This mature, righteous priest encounters an angel of God and responds in a way I don't think most of us would have expected. Mary's response, first response is this. How will this be? Her response lacks skepticism or doubt. Her question concerns merely the logistics of how this whole thing will be possible. And after the angel explains what is going to happen, Mary gives a remarkable response. I am the Lord's servant. This statement and her conclusion, may your word to me be fulfilled, indicate that she trusts the words of the angel. The statement she makes, though, that she is the Lord's servant is interesting to me. She isn't asking for any more information. She's not asking for proof. She isn't talking about what she thinks or what she feels. She makes a statement, a 
about her identity. Her remark declares that whatever she thinks about whatever is going to happen, whatever the angel said, and whatever she feels about it all, her commitment is to be obedient and to be faithful to God. Her greatest concern isn't so much the, these incredible claims that the angel of God made, but her submission to God's will, whatever it might be. And this, then, completes the comparison between Zechariah and Mary. They both respond in a way that it would be, it would be well-reasoned to not have expected. So this morning, I want to think about four takeaways or lessons from this short story. And the first one is this. This is the point from verse 37. No word from God will ever fail. The Messiah was promised hundreds of years prior, all the way back in Genesis. Jesus is the promised snake crusher, the promised descendant king of David, of, Ki of King David. The people of God waited centuries and endured all kinds of evils and hardships, but God's word still came to pass. There were 400 years between Jesus and the last of the prophets, and so many thought that God had abandoned them. And this wasn't the case. There are times when it can be hard to see how good is working in the bad, and with evil around us, how God is working through and in it. But whatever is happening, and whatever will happen to us, to our church, to our country, this past Easter reminds us that God has already won. And there is coming a day in which he's making all things new. This is not a blind faith either. We can trust God now and in the future because we can look back and remember what God has already done. Point two this morning is that God can and does use the most unexpected people. Most of us probably would have expected that Zechariah would have been the hero of chapter 1. He had all the right qualifications. He was old, wise, smart, righteous, and experienced. But if we're looking for a person who just really gets it, his response to the angel demonstrates that it isn't him. It was a young woman. There's nothing really said about her other than God favored her and was with her. God doesn't use a type. And don't ever think that someone else is incapable of being used by God because of their age, their race, their culture, their sex, their education, their physical abilities, their talents, or lack thereof. And here too, may you remind yourself that you are ne never able to be un you you <laughs> are never unable to be used by God for any reason either. God can and does use everyone, and because of that, we can give thanks to God. My third point this morning is this. Maturity or intelligence or a high religious position won't mean anything without an obedient response. Some people love to rest on their laurels or their natural talent. We see all kinds of people who are really good at something but don't work or practice. Some people work hard to get into a certain place and don't follow through with more learning or development. In time, the skill they worked for wanes. As their skill diminishes, they are no longer as effective at the same level that they once were. In a similar way, naturally talented people who don't practice may not lose as much, but they won't reach their real potential. This is true in sports, music, or skilled labor. Imagine, for instance, someone who's really naturally good at basketball, but never spends the time to practice or to run drills. Their only hindrance is their personal choice. A similar thing, then, can happen to us with our walk with Jesus. 
Zechariah had all the right cards in his hand, and yet he responded poorly. We sometimes respond in a similar fashion. No amount of education that you've done in the past, or scripture reading in the past, or spiritual development in the past will mean much if we aren't leaning into our walk with Jesus now. Our faith cannot continue to grow without faith, without trust, without obedience. My training, my education, and my mentoring as a pastor are all great tools to help me follow Jesus, but they're just that, tools. And this isn't a knock against things like education or Bible studies or worship services or camps or any other kind of spiritual or intellectual activity. On the contrary, our lives and walks with Jesus are deepened when we have and when we use those resources. Things like maturity and education and experience are indispensable aids in following Jesus. The point that I'm making this morning is that these tools are just that. Tools. They are not the end goal themselves, but aids to reach the end goal. To be more whole, healed, redeemed, and transformed in the likeness of Jesus. And now if we come to my last point this morning. Your identity matters. When confronted with a difficult situation, understand to whom you belong and to which kingdom your allegiance is. The question here is not so much doubt or no doubt, but whether you are gods or not gods. Doubt itself is not necessarily the problem. To have faith in the first place generally means that you are choosing to trust in the face of uncertainty. Much in the same way, courage isn't the absence of fear, but the choice to follow through anyway. In this case, root yourself in Christ and learn to trust God. In this, we love God and trust God, not blindly, but confidently. Because we have already seen God do great things. And it is because of what God has done through Jesus and what God has done in our lives in the past, we can confidently pursue the will of God in difficult situations. So the only question, and the biggest question for you this morning, is to whom or to what do you belong? I um, got to the end of the sermon and I'm finding myself with another um, postscriptum comment where I'm, my sermon's finished and there's kind of one last nagging thing that I don't know really where to fit into the sermon, but I think it's important to recognize. And so this is that closing thought. I think that large parts of the sermon are, might be a little too harsh on Zechariah. I think if we're honest, a lot of us would admit that if we were in his shoes, we probably would have responded more like him than Mary. Whatever is to be said about Zachariah's momentary doubt, it didn't keep God from using him. He was still used by God. And God's word still came true. If you have a Zachariah moment, let it only be an opportunity to learn. When he could speak again, Zechariah didn't complain. He didn't even lament about, a lament about his doubt or his experience. His focus was firmly on what God was doing. His focus was focused. His focus was on God's promise being fulfilled. Zechariah was too busy praising God to worry about the past, and we would do well to do likewise. And this morning. This is where we come to communion. And this is where we remember that Jesus poured his life out for us. And we too are invited to pour out our lives back to God. We here practice open communion, which means you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to participate. Our only concern is that you are seeking to draw closer to God. What will happen here in a moment is Kaylee is going to come up. Um, and she's going to have the elements. And after I pray, I would invite you to come forward. You're going to um, 
take the elements, you'll go back to your seat, and then we will partake, uh, and I'll give instructions then. So I'm going to pray, come up, and then take it back to your seat. If you are unable physically to come up, um, would you please just raise your hand so Keely can come up to you? Because I don't want, if you have um, some physical stuff going on, I don't want you to be uncomfortable in this experience. So please um, just raise your hand and Keely will come to you. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks. Broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray to God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this chance to worship. We are thankful for this chance to come to the table and remember what you've done, the sacrifice you've made. And we pray, God, that as we come forward, as we receive the elements, that we too would be reminded of our call to be your hands and feet. We pray, God, that you would continue to pour out your grace in our life, God. Pour out your grace to make us whole, to make us healed, to make us forgiven. Because God, this morning we need you. I pray this all in Jesus' powerful name. Come forward as you are right able. serve you blameless of the everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. We'll be thankful. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you, preserve you blameless of the everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. We'll be thankful. Closing, receive this benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, be perfect, be of a good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the love of God and the peace of God will be with you. Amen. Go in peace.